conversation, question, answer, and discussion uh, with the panelists. And uh, as we close this evening, we're going to uh, spend some time in uh, smaller conversation groups. And there are members of uh, the, the emerging Fort Worth IPNL chapter who are going to facilitate those conversations around tables or in small groups. And the, the goal of that is, uh, those conversations is that we might uh, reflect on what we've heard this evening in smaller groups and to share ideas, uh, practices about how we might move forward, how we uh, take some of what we've learned uh, this evening and put it into practice in our own lives and in our own faith communities, uh, and how we continue this uh, interfaith conversation uh, toward uh, a sustainable practice around issues of water and the environment. So the first person we're going to hear from who couldn't be with us, who wanted to be with us this evening, uh, is uh, Andy Sansom, and uh, Dr. Sansom is the director of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment located at Texas State in San Marcos. He is uh, formerly, I think he was the director of the Texas uh, Forest uh, Parks and Wildlife Department, and now is sort of the, the guru of all uh, things water in Texas. Uh, he he uh, has a great wealth of experience and knowledge, and he's going to, we've uh, interviewed him, and we're going to show that interview uh, that he did for this event for us, because he couldn't be with us, uh, to um, sort of share what, what the issues are facing us in Texas, and especially North Texas. Uh, the water issues, the concrete uh, challenges that we're facing. And it's from that, uh, establishing those, uh, that, uh, the issues that we'll start reflecting on uh, uh, from our religious and theological perspectives. Uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, Rabbi uh, Larry Troster, uh, who is with us on the screen here. Uh, and Rabbi Troster is one of the country's leading Jewish eco-theologians and uh, environmental leader. He is uh, creator and former director of the Green Faith Fellowship Program. And if you don't know about the Green Faith uh, organization, I encourage you to, to uh, look them up online and learn about uh, the resources they offer for the practice of uh, ecological sustainability among religious congregations. Uh, also, very um, fortuitously, uh, Rabbi Troster's latest publication is Mikor Hayim, a source book on water and Judaism. So we have uh, the most uh, up-to-date uh, um, expert on, on Jewish theology of water here uh, with us this evening. And we appreciate you joining us from all the way from New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Bill Greenway is with us uh, to my left. He is the Associate Professor of Philosophical Theology at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary to the south of us. And he focuses on contemporary conversations among theology, philosophy, church, and society. And Bill has uh, been teaching and reflecting and writing about uh, issues of uh, ecological sustainability and ecological justice from a Christian theological perspective uh, for a number of years. Uh, he has a number of publications uh, on the topic and has presented at both academic conferences and in uh, religious communities. And so we're uh, very uh, grateful that he came all the way from Austin this evening to be with us for this uh, event. And then, so we're sort of going from the, the person who's joined us from the farthest distance to the closest distance. We've gone from New Jersey to Austin. And uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Karishma Himat Singhani. Uh, who is coming from Plano, which probably felt almost like it was um, as far away as Austin, the traffic and the construction of the Metroplex freeways. Um, she holds a master's degree in economics from uh, Bikram University in India, and she is currently CEO of Radio Karishma, an internet radio station that caters to a South Indian audience. Uh, she's been doing that for more than eight years now. And she was inspired to start her own internet radio uh, to provide a medium to freely express ideas and information about Hindu history, culture, festivals, music, uh, and issues. Uh, she's associated with a number of religious foundations, including being a vice president with the Green Yatra Action Network, and we might hear uh, more about that in, in, on her presentation. It's an organization 
which seeks to inspire a global Hindu response to environmental challenges. So please uh, join me in welcoming all of our panelists this evening. First, uh, from Andy Sansom uh, via the video interview, and then we'll engage the panelists. Uh, Lauren Baxter is going to share with us some technical procedure about how to interact with our Skype guest. The first thing I'm going to do is just uh, the sound here because we've got a little out of sync. Hopefully that'll make a difference overall. Um, you'll notice that we have several screens in this space, um, and the screen to my right actually has a camera smack in the middle of it. So if you have a question and specifically uh, directed to the rabbi, if you'll come to the microphone that's at the front of, uh, right next to uh, Dr. Hessel Robinson, um, and if you're addressing him specifically, go ahead and look straight at the camera, and that gives uh, him the feeling that you're looking at him straight in the eyes. So I did my best to get it up there close to his eyes. Um, so hopefully that'll be helpful for you all. Um, and if, if everybody's distracted by having this screen on, I'm happy to mute that one. Okay. We're okay with it? Okay. the goal. <laughs> Let's try this again. all of the issues that we face in maintaining these kind of precious water uh, systems as we continue to grow uh, and continue to uh, use more and more water for industry, for agriculture, for municipal use and other things. The challenge of maintaining places like this in the years ahead is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Most people in Texas today now live in urban areas they go in the kitchen and turn on the tap and the water comes out and go in the bathroom and flush the toilet and it works. And everything's okay. And uh, we, we gotta shake people out of that mindset because we are this is the single greatest challenge in my judgment, certainly from a natural resource standpoint, facing the coming generation. Here in America we use about five hundred liters of water per day per person. Over a billion people in the rest of the world less than six liters of water per day. There are more people in the world today that own mobile phones than own toilets. Across the world, across the world, the average woman walks nine miles a day to get the water necessary to support her family and carries at least four gallons on every trip. Every 20 seconds around the world, a child dies because of a lack of water or poor water quality. So it is a it is it is an issue that extends far beyond us here, 
to really the rest of the world. But it's it's a it's a big deal in Texas, and we should not make no mistake about that. Our population is going to double in the next 50 years, and yet we have already given permission for more water to be withdrawn from many of our rivers, like this one, than is actually in them today. So I said, if all those water rights were actually exercised, some of the most important and iconic rivers in Texas would be completely dry. And yet we're going to have to find water for twice as many people in the generation ahead. We tend to believe that we can build our way out of this problem. Uh, after the drought of the 1950s, we went on a binge here in Texas, you know, really throughout the Southwest, to uh, build a lot of stuff. Uh, the reservoirs, the dams, pipelines, I mean, big infrastructure. And, frankly, uh, that system is served as well. We have in Texas, for example, uh, almost 200 reservoirs that were built since the 1950s. And so what we're going to be hearing in the months and weeks ahead is that all we need to do is come up with about $53 billion, build some more stuff, and this will be okay. And I think the, the, the most important message that we can get out is that that simply won't do it. That, that many of the most significant hurdles that we're going to have to overcome are not infrastructure, they're policy. The issue has been largely the exclusive providence of what I call the usual suspects. Those are in civil engineering firms, uh, municipal water districts, uh, large interests like utilities that depend on large quantities of water to cool their power plants. And so there's been a relatively narrow segment of society that is really engaged in the water issue. In my mind, one of the most important things we can do going forward is to involve other um, segments of society in the conversation. Everybody lives downstream from somebody else. And one of the things that we really have to remember is that as we try to resolve these water issues, that, for example, if you live in Houston and you and the water that you drink comes from the Trinity River, every drop of it has already gone through the wastewater treatment systems in Dallas and Fort Worth. And so even the act of disposing of the water that we use back into the system has an impact on our neighbor that lives downstream of us, in addition to flows remaining into our basin estuaries. People are going to be increasingly saying, okay, well, this will be okay if we just reuse all the water that's going through our system, say, in the Metroplex. But the fact is, we have to remember that not only the people downstream of us, but the environment along our coast is dependent on those return flows back into the system. And so we've got to be very careful when we think about both the quality of water that we discharge back into the system, but also a sufficient flow to serve the needs of people and the environment downstream. People often ask me, particularly when they're presented with some of the really pretty stark and frightening facts about the challenge we're facing with water, people often ask this one person, you know, what, what can I do? Well, what I tell people is, what you can do is you can take a kid fishing. You can take a kid on one of these glass bottom boats. You can take a child swimming in the San Marcos or the Guadalupe or the Comal or any one of the number of places in Texas where they can have direct contact with not only with water but with the natural world. My firm belief is that when people realize how fun and inspirational it is to be in the water, to be exposed to the water, to see it literally coming out of the ground in millions of gallons per day, then they form an attachment, which otherwise they would never be able to achieve, and begin to understand that they have to assume responsibility for it in order for it to be there for their children. And that's a proven, a proven connection. Uh, we, we have thousands of school children who come to this place every year. And their teachers tell us that no matter how many times they tell their kids about the springs, it doesn't connect until they look down in the water and they actually see it coming out of the ground and they become both enlightened but inspired. I grew up on a creek. My father was um, and mother were um, thoughtful enough that they provided us with a home that was on a creek, ran right through our backyard. It was a large enough uh, stream that we could put a boat on it and escape. And so I spent most days after school and on the weekends on the water.
Okay, now we are ready to hear from uh, Rabbi Foster. Larry? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate uh, in this program this evening. It's a real privilege, and uh, as you can imagine, because I spent uh, part of last year working on my source book uh, on Judaism in the Water, it's, it's an area that is, uh, is really one that fascinates me. Uh, I want to begin by noting that uh, very often a culture can be understood through the language in, that it speaks. And so when you look back at the ancient Israelites, uh, you'll see that in biblical Hebrew, there are 10 different words for rain. Uh, this is because uh, they, the Israelites were extremely sensitive to the kinds of rain that came. In addition to that, um, there's another eight words for clouds and numerous words for cisterns, springs, aqueducts, and things of that sort. And the reason for this is that the historic land of Israel uh, did not have any large rivers. For those of you who've been there, you'll know that the Jordan River is really not much bigger than what an American would call a creek. Uh, the so-called Sea of Galilee is a, not a very large lake. Uh, and so unlike Egypt and Mesopotamia, where the civilizations were assured of a steady supply of water for drinking and for irrigation, the land of Israel was almost completely dependent on rainfall. And one of the things about the ecology of Israel is that it has a variety of different ecosystems or domains that meet in that area. So you have uh, what is really called a pastoral domain which has a certain level of rainfall, which allows enough plants uh, for uh, herding uh, uh, sheep, goats, and cattle. You have a rain-fed domain, which is, uh, there's enough rain for agriculture. And you have a desert domain, which really doesn't get enough rainfall for much of anything. In addition to that, you also get the maritime domain along the coast. Um, and because of this uh, quite variable uh, geography and ecology, um, the land of Israel uh, developed rather um, a variety of different uh, cultures within a very small uh, area. Now, this uh, dependency on rainfall, uh, as a result, uh, determined a lot about some of the theology that we find in the Hebrew Bible. 
if Jewish theology focuses on divine action in, uh, in the world, in creation, revelation, and redemption, in each one of these, water plays a very interesting role. Um, one of the most important texts is found in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses uh, 10 to 17, where uh, Moses specifically tells the Israelites that the land of Israel that they are going to be um, coming into is unlike Egypt. And whereas a person could be self-sufficient in the land of Egypt because of the river, in the land of Israel they had to depend upon God, who was the source of rain. Namely, that rain was not a kind of neutral event, but reflected the will of God. And if the people lived up to the covenant, then God was going to provide plentiful rainfall, not only in amount, but also at the right time. One of the things that you find in that passage is the use of two terms for rainfall. What is called the Yorve, and the Malkosh. And the Yore is the early rain, uh, which comes usually in late November and December. Israel really only has uh, two seasons, winter and summer. Uh, and so in the early part of what is the winter, you have a very light rainfall, the Yore, which softens the soil, which has been baked pretty hard by the summer sun, and allows the uh, the, the soil to become porous enough to take the heavier rain, the malkosh, that comes later on. So if the initial rain is too hard, it will merely run off. Um, if the uh, later rain is too light, it will not sufficiently soak the soil. The Israelites tended to have two different crops. They would plant one crop um, in the fall and harvest it in the early spring. And then they would plant a second crop that would be harvested uh, in the following fall. And you had to have enough moisture in the soil in order for these crops to work. You didn't uh, have irrigation on any kind of large scale. There were, however, uh, water technology that if you, even today, if you're going to Jerusalem, you can see that many of the hills around Jerusalem have ancient terraces where little flat areas were cut into these hills so that as the water ran down from the top, they watered these little plots um, and that were used uh, to raise crops. So rain, therefore, was strictly um, in the, uh, you might say, in the purview and the control of God. And this allowed uh, the Israelites to believe that there was a direct connection between the fertility of the land and therefore the fertility of crops uh, and animals and human beings and their obedience uh, to the covenant. So in this respect, you can understand why uh, a lack of rainfall would be seen as divine displeasure. And in fact, in later rabbinic Judaism, there's a whole tractate of the Talmud devoted to the kinds of public fasts that should be declared should there be droughts in order to, in a way, to do penance for uh, some way uh, breaking the covenant. The other area where water plays a significant role, of course, are in the creation stories in both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and in other creation texts found throughout uh, the Hebrew Bible. And there, water functions as the basic resource of creation. It is the primordial resource out of which everything else is derived and the control of which is extremely important. Because it would seem that, again, if you have too little water, you don't have life and fertility. But if you have too much water, then you can have floods and uh, chaos. So when you look at the way creation is depicted in the Hebrew Bible, what's, what is usually started uh, at the beginning of each creation story is the control of the primordial water, that God controls the primordial water and directs it into constructive uh, channels. And this is most clearly seen uh, in Psalm 104, for example. Now, water, therefore, as the basic resource of creation, um, becomes a uh, means for resetting creation, 
bringing things back to the beginning. Hence, Noah's flood was an attempt by God to reset creation, reboot it, to use modern uh, uh, computer language, back to the beginning so that uh, creation could start over again. And when you look at the purification rituals in the Hebrew Bible, most specifically those found in the priestly schools in Leviticus, for example, you find that water functions as a purification, um, but not as part of the purification itself, but as a preliminary resetting of the person who then can be properly purified. And usually the purification ritual employs of sacrifice, but it has to begin with washing of clothes, immersion of the body, so that in a way um, is resetting the person uh, back to their uh, pristine state. Um, the other important thing that you find in the Bible is the use of water as a metaphor, and here um, there is a tremendous uh, number of, uh, of metaphors uh, in, in the Bible that, uh, that refer to, uh, to water. Um, the, um, for example, God is very often referred to as living water, uh, a source of living water. Nikor Chaim, Nikor Mayim Chaim, and that's the reason why I called my book the core Chaim, the source of life. Um, one of the more interesting ones is found in Jeremiah, where he calls God a fountain of living water and complains about those who are worshiping idols as people who are putting their trust as if they were um, looking at damaged cisterns that will not hold any water at all. Uh, one of the other things that you find also is that occasionally in the book of Proverbs, which is from the wisdom tradition, um, wisdom, chokhmah, is compared to living water. And then, of course, if, since wisdom comes from God, in a certain sense, wisdom is a kind of water of life because it teaches you the proper way to live. Later on, the rabbinical tradition um, takes that wisdom idea, that what, you know, the metaphor of wisdom as a living spring, and they apply it to Torah. The Torah, therefore, becomes the living water. Um, one of the other ones, of course, you find is that uh, in the book of Amos, in chapter 5, there is a very famous passage that sees water um, as the water of justice. Let justice flow like a mighty stream, which very often people see as a positive image. But in fact, I personally believe that Amos, in effect, is saying uh, the flood is coming back. and. Uh, justice, like the flood that scoured the evil from the earth, will scour the evildoers uh, from this uh, from this time. So um, I just want to mention one other aspect of this, and that is water in the um, in the text of redemption. And here, if you're uh, one of the most important chapters, are is found in the latter part of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel in the final chapters of his book talks about the rebuilt temple. And in his vision of the new temple in Jerusalem, he has this wonderful vision of a river that is going to come out from under the temple and flow down towards the Dead Sea. And it will be a mighty river, which will produce trees like those of the Garden of Eden with fish. In other words, Israel will no longer, in the, uh, in the period of the redemption, have to rely upon chancy rain, but God, in God's goodness, will grant them uh, the ability to have the land to become a river culture with uh, continued and assured sources of water. Um, there's a similar um, vision in uh, the book of Zechariah, but there, in fact, there are two uh, rivers. One flows down towards the Dead Sea, by the way, the book of Ezekiel turns the Dead Sea into a sweet uh, water lake, and the other flows westward down uh, towards the Mediterranean. So um, there are many ways in which um, this notion that we will, there will be water um, that will not be uh, chancy, that will be assured, is part and parcel of the uh, vision of redemption that is found 
in some of the latter um, uh, profits. <coughs> so um, what I'd like to do is to then talk a little bit about um, what I believe my tradition would say uh, about water at the time of scarcity. And when you look at uh, the situation in the world today where we have increasing numbers of people um, and developing countries using more and more water per capita, and fresh water is a finite resource, by the way, uh, it becomes pretty clear that the control of water has been and will continue to be a major source of um, conflict. Uh, in fact, even in the Bible, in the story of Isaac, there's a story of Isaac coming into conflict over water with the Philistines. That's actually the, the only text in the Hebrew Bible that directly talks about that kind of conflict. And the way Isaac and the Philistines resolve this is through some kind of mutual treaty to share the sources of the water. In other words, one uh, group will be on one territory, another group will be on another territory, and they will therefore share the water and not fight over it. And I think this goes to the heart of a very important Jewish concept, which is called tzedek, which is often translated as righteousness or justice, but its core meaning is equity. That in the perfect world, there is perfect equity in human society, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, and when it comes to economic and political power, and even when it comes to humans' relationship with the rest of creation. Now, this is a vision which human society doesn't uh, rarely achieves, but it is something that we can work towards. And I think that it's really important for those of us who live in developed countries understand how unequitable the distribution of resources often is in this world, and how we use and waste uh, resources on a scale uh, which is really unprecedented in human history. So um, what do we do about it? Uh, from my work in, with Green Faith and with the Coalition on Environment and Jewish Life, I think that religious communities have a vital role to play in attempting to educate their members to become more sustainable in their personal lives. The community itself should try to be sustainable in, the, in its facilities and its use of resources, but it can also reinforce those values through their religious tradition, through study of sacred texts, through ritual, through prayer, through sermons, uh, that sort of thing. Um, when I was the director of the fellowship program, which was an interfaith uh, leadership training program for religious leaders to become religious environmental leaders, one of the things that they had to do was to develop a project for their local communities. And one of my uh, Green Bay fellows, a Lutheran pastor from Oregon, developed a really wonderful uh, program for her congregation based on the notion that environmental education, one of the key questions of environmental education is to teach people where things come from and where things go. Because, um, as I think has been mentioned, you know, we turn on a tap, we see the water come, and very few people know the source of where their water comes from. It's a question I often ask uh, groups that, when I lecture them, whether they know where their water comes from. And, of course, where does the waste go? And they usually do not know. So this Lutheran minister had a program where she took a number of her uh, members of her community on a bus to the very source of the water for the town that they lived in. They went all the way up the river to the actual spring where the river came from. They followed the river down, um, and they also saw where the wastewater was being treated. But at the source, they did a prayer service uh, to thank God for that that water. And I think that's a beautiful example, and of course some of the other things mentioned in the film are very similar, of showing people um, and getting them sensitized to the notion that this is not an infinite resource, that it is something precious, and that we don't manufacture it. It comes from <coughs> itself. 
So I really think that uh, that's something that uh, communities should do. Another thing that uh, somebody once mentioned to me was that when you put your return address on anything, you should also put down what water you live in. Because practically everybody lives in the watershed of some river or stream. And when you see yourself not only living in a town or a state with human boundaries, but part of what we call your eco-location, it may sensitize you and others to the fact that you are part of an ecosystem, that you're not isolated, that you're constantly uh, exchanging water, air, and all kinds of other things uh, with your uh, the ecosystem that you live in. And so uh, one thing about myself is I will tell you that I live in the watershed of the Hackensack River, um, which eventually flows into uh, Newark Bay, where the Hudson flows into, and the Passaic. And uh, the Hackensack River um, has had a very interesting history uh, and because we have a riverkeeper organization on the Hackensack, it's a lot cleaner than it has been in decades. Um, I know where my water comes from. Uh, I know where my waste goes. I've been uh, to the waste plants. Um, I know where the water comes from. I haven't visited it myself personally, but I know exactly where it comes from. Uh, and these are things that um, I feel that we need to uh, make people aware uh, in a spiritual sense, not merely in a factual sense, an existential sense, for them to really understand uh, what it means to waste this kind of creation. So I'm going to stop there, and I hope you were able to hear me okay, and uh, we'll take it from there when people have questions. Thank you very much, and we heard you uh, perfectly loud and clear. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move on to the other panelists, and then at the end of the, <coughs> their presentations, we'll have uh, an open time of uh, conversation, uh, question and answer for all three of them. Uh, so, Bill. great to be here tonight and see you all here talking about this vital issue. As you can hear, I'm recovering from something, but I'm past any point where I'm a danger to any of you all, so <laughs> relax about that. Um, this is kind of a, uh, some gestures towards a sketch of um, um, uh, why spirituality is um, critical to water policy and a just and sustainable uh, future. I'm going to interpret this as excited chattering about webs. <laughs> uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, with Christianity, of, of course, you know, Paul and Jesus and all the rest are thoroughly Jewish. So anything you just heard about Jews and water pertains to Christians. And I'm not going to spend much time going back over that. I mean, it's waters of life, it's the same. Uh, uh, imagery you just heard, if you're a Christian, you're very familiar with it. And of course, a central Christian ritual is baptism, where literally you are uh, ducked or sprinkled, and that's a big debate, but we won't get into it, with the waters of life. So, I mean, really, water equals life, uh, and uh, that is consistent through uh, Jewish and Christian and, and, of course, many other uh, traditions as well. Um, what I want to address in terms of the um, significance of spirituality for this discussion. I mean, this is really a commons issue. Uh, I went back and looked at a lot of literature from Tragedy of Commons and Garrett Hardin in the 60s up to the present about uh, how to uh, motivate people to uh, distribute the commons uh, in a just and equitable way. There's a lot of concern among academics that we do this, but there doesn't seem to be much um, idea of how to go about getting it done. One thing that's common in all the literature is, and this is shared from Hardin forward, is to be rational is to act selfishly. And so we have to begin by assuming that all actors are going to act selfishly uh, and then figure out how to deal with that. Whether or not there's any hope 
that people could work together collectively or individually and not act selfishly is not really raised in the literature as a realistic possibility. Uh, and that's why I want to say spirituality and uh, diverse religious communities, and to my knowledge, all of them, uh, do call for something uh, and do reflect people who are moved by something beyond immediate self-interest. Um, I'm concerned about a disjunction in our society uh, and really kind of a loss of the moral uh, and a disjunction between, for instance, what is moral and what is ethical. I'm concerned about who stole my cheese, which really puts it right out there. It's been stolen, but don't ask about anything having been done wrong to you. Don't ask whether your whole life now has been spent faithfully accumulating things, and at this point you need to just start, just start over and do the work you need to be. I'm concerned about uh, the current spate of articles reporting on financial dealings which are clearly unethical, but not illegal, period. Turn the page to the next article, as if there's nothing more to be said. When the distinction between the legal and the ethical gets significant enough, course, you lose the legitimization of the state, and you get something like the here square, where to be a moral and ethical people is to be squarely on the side of the people who are doing what is blatantly illegal. This is not a safe disjunction to be uh, growing. So I'm concerned about the naturalizing of this, where it's natural to be selfish, and to think that this is not natural and what we should presume is somehow unreasonable of us and to be ill-informed about the character of human motivation is realistic thing to think about. Um, and I'm concerned about the magical thinking that thinks that somehow if you simply can unleash selfish impulses in the proper way, a good and just and equitable result will magically poof into existence. This does make me feel better about belief in incarnation, which seems to me comparatively reasonable and obvious. Um, so I'm concerned about these things. Um, and I'm concerned about what then follows from that is why should we follow the laws, right? If we develop policy, why should I follow that? Well, somehow it has to be uh, because it's in my self-interest and probably you're not going to be left with some sort of Leviathan appeal on the whole, which means because if I don't do this, I'm going to get penalized. In other words, in terms of the whole thing, once the moral drops out, it's might makes right and the reason to do what is legal is because of the might. The, the moral drops out of the discourse. I'm, I'm very concerned about this uh, trajectory. I'm very interested, by contrast, by, uh, and I'm inspired here by a Jewish thinker by the name of Emmanuel Levinas, and I'm just going to gesture towards a couple of his terms, because he's very concerned in the wake of what he too sees as a loss of the ethical dimension in contemporary um, uh, reflection. Um, uh, and, and really, as among elites, uh, this is in some ways less a problem um, among folks who are just dealing with one another and are very moral and awake to the moral in their day-to-day -day happenings. He, he wants us to reawaken to the moral dimension. And he um, talks to us about, this is a language to talk about uh, with this, and I'm just going to gesture uh, uh, to it. But he wants to talk about the distinction between faces and faces. The second faces has a um, uh, capital F. And I'm going to do some things he doesn't do, but just for ease of presentation. When we think of faces, you think of you know, you know my 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 race, my class, uh, my status in society, all the different things that we think of uh, when we identify and put ourselves in some sort of a relationship according to uh, an economy, uh, according to where we are in our social standing, according to where we relate to each other in terms of uh, power. But for Levinas, and this is all then something I interpret, it's all very much a, uh, a, um, an understanding, a comprehension, a grasping. Note how these terms are all spiritually possessive, from me to the other. Levinas wants to emphasize the face which, to the contrary, seizes you. And this is something that happens to us all the time. Uh, it can be times of, of, of pain or suffering, even imagined faces when we saw the smoke going up from that apartment building and we're suddenly concerned. Are, are people trapped? 
what's happening right now across that city. Those faces we couldn't even see seized us. You, you watch an earthquake on the news or a flood on the news. Those faces seize you. You're not interpreting them. They have you, and you are immediately morally involved. You're not deciding to react. You're not deciding to uh, sacrifice. You are called to react. You are moved. You want to help. You immediately agree. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. You can be walking down the street and the married couple's coming down from the church all smiles, and suddenly you're all smiles too. You're seized by their faces. This is a very different way, a very real way of relating to others, and it's at the heart of the most valuable experiences we have. An experience when we find ourselves seized by others, either in joy or in suffering, but nonetheless taken by them in moments that are Full, full of, of, of meaning uh, and call. Uh, it, it, in other words, what this does is, in terms of ethical action, or why I would formulate policy, it's, this un, unveils and allows us to articulate that it's a love that's at the core of it. And suddenly it's not a matter of sacrifice, it's not a matter of obeying some external ideal, it's a matter of allowing policy to be formed, allowing us to be together in a community, doing what we want to do out of a cultivated openness and awakening to the faces of others. And I'm going to move off of that. All right. Uh, um, um, oh, I want to do, well, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm trying to, I want to keep this uh, uh, brief. So that's the why. That was the thing. So in terms of spirituality, so uh, we're going to start. The concern is a commons issue. It's water. Uh, it's clear that for Christianity, water is life, right? It's a common good. It's a basic good. It's a fundamental good. The question is, why would I give it to all that doesn't become an external rule? I want to say one thing that's missing. I want to use the literature I referred to, by the way. We have to be self-interest is real. These other dynamics are real. I'm not saying to ignore that literature. I'm saying that what you add to it, so it doesn't become immediately a sacrifice, immediately an opposition, immediately something where you lose the joy of being moral. The reason to do it, to form a policy, is to save the faces of others because you move to want to save them. So suddenly you're happy about the policies. It's not a sacrifice. It's not an either or between I get what I want or those other people get what they want. Right? It's that we now can figure out how to give everyone as much as we want. The second question is, who? Who? Because often this debate and other uh, ecological debates remain very anthropocentric, very human-centered. So I want to gesture to something else that involves water and that we've already had a reference to, and that is the flood. Uh, and and uh, the reaction uh, to the flood. Now, the, the flood happened. Something happened. Uh, we, it's in almost all of the ancient Near Eastern accounts. Uh, we have some notions. It might have been an ice dam or something like that. There's, there's little doubt, though, that, that the ancient Israelites carried a memory of a devastating uh, water event uh, and that the flood account is, is, you know, there's a long oral history, of course, but it, it, it's representing a response to that event. I don't want to get that uh, into that in detail, um, but I do want to look at the so-called Noahic Covenant, which is the response of God to the flood. God, by the way, comes as close to repenting of this as of anything. Uh, remember this, you know, it's never going to happen again. Uh, it didn't work, right? So this is a another creation attempt. These are the primordial waters that have been separated returning. There's no doubt about that. And once again, uh, this hasn't worked. I want to read the covenant, though, and I want to connect it to your experience of faces, which probably have not only been human. Your experience of faces you've seen even on the side of the road, maybe a, a wounded, you know, a, a squirrel you've hit or a cat. Uh, or maybe it's a horse that you were befriended. Maybe it's, you know, a, a dog or a cat. We are awakened and seized by all sorts of faces. Uh, and I want to make sure that that's clear too. And I'm reading this uh, not because I want you to do this because the Bible says so. I want to talk about this notion of faces. And, and I want to say that just as we've been seized by so many human faces, we're seized by all sorts of faces of all sorts of creatures beloved by God. And I want you to see that this awareness of having been seized by every faces is, is blatant 
in a classic text that you'll recognize, but maybe you haven't heard before. So I'm going to read this covenant with Noah, so-called. You'll see this is a very bad name that systematically excludes most of the covenant members. And I want you to listen for the inclusion of all creatures and all creation in terms of the sensitivity to faces which is expressed by the ancient Israelites in this account. In other words, this account is telling us after the flood, in reaction to this, whose suffering was witnessed? What was the mourning over? Who are we saying to? This is not going to happen again. This is now the covenant I established with you. Let me just read this. is Genesis 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And, with, uh, and uh, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Thus, uh, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you uh, for all ages. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth, and the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And I didn't repeat anything there. It's just over and over over again. Somehow we haven't heard it. So when we were seeing the fish in the estuaries and we were being told, connect with these creatures, this is a classic biblical command. This is a classic awakening to all faces. And it's out of that awakening to all faces uh, that we should find the spiritual motivation uh, and that we can preach the spiritual motivation that will empower us to policies which will allow us to, in our uh, communities together, uh, reflect the love of God, which seizes us in the faces of all these others. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here and giving me an opportunity to speak. On behalf of Gyan, um, the Green Yatra Action Network, and um, well, we'll definitely talk about that when asked later on. But uh, right now, um, I'm here to speak on again very vital issue: water, and water does matters, as has been said in all the religions. Uh, you know, water is life. Well, there is no second question about that. Water is life, and. Um, I think uh, before I go and present the water in Hinduism, um, it is very important that I do talk about Hinduism a little bit. Um, what is the philosophy, Hindu philosophy, and uh, what is the Hindu philosophy about nature in the whole, and then we come to the waters. And of course, I would try and keep it brief, not making it too um, detailed or boring, of course. So, um, Hinduism is a popular word for, the, for our religion, which is uh, originally known as Sanatan Dharma. And um, so, the first question comes, what is Dharma? Now, uh, religion is, this, uh, is a synonym for Dharma in English, but that is because there is no better word for that in English. But uh, Dharma, it's, uh, it, it, it's a very, very... Um, it, it's, it's a huge word. It is um, a very, very uh, impactful word. And it uh, starts, it's actually um, uh, made with the word, the root of the word is dhra, which is a Sanskrit word and which means to uphold, to sustain, to maintain, and to support. And dharma is, is 
kind of tool or um, you can say a medium or as a lifestyle to actually um, you know, uphold or sustain whatever we have. And it is believed in Hinduism, in Sanatana Dharma, that the universe was made in its purest form. So what is Dharma now? Dharma is to actually help sustain or maintain or support, uphold that purest form. Now, it is, uh, you can say that it's a universal law of nature that, uh, you know, you, you, you keep your uh, action or you keep your uh, Dharma um, to the point that you can maintain the purity of the world the way it was built. That is the ideal situation, we can say. And um, as far as uh, Hindu philosophy is concerned, it maintains that both the individual and the cosmos are independent. That means that whatever is happening in the world or in the cosmos, it is ha uh, and whoever is living in that cosmos or in the universe, the action of the nature and of the person or the mankind living on the earth are interdependent. And uh, whatever is uh, happening on the earth on the present day, or what happened in the earth in the past, or will happen in the future, will be the combined action of the nature and the, the persons or the people living on this earth. And uh, well, we can say that induced conditions on the earth. So now induced conditions, who are gonna induce those conditions? Of course, the, the living beings, the things who are living on the earth. And uh, well, there, there comes the, the, uh, the cosmic law of karma. That means action. So all the induced conditions on the earth is happening because of the action of the people living on that earth. It's as simple as, as, simple as that. That whatever we do, we get that back. We act, the way we act, we get the result. It's as simple as that, it's common sense. And that is the cosmic law of karma as defined in Hinduism. And um, it is believed, and in our ancient scriptures in Vedas, it is believed that um, a human body, any living body on this earth is made of five elements. Panchabhutam, that is what's called in liquid. And we have four Vedas, as we all know, as Atharvaved, um, uh, Rig Ved, uh, Yajur Ved, Sam Ved, and Atharvaved, four Vedas. And they all say one thing, and besides that, there are so many other uh, scriptures. And uh, unlike other uh, religions, uh, Hinduism has many scriptures to follow. And they are like doctrines, and like, they provide a way of life, how to lead your life, ideally, to keep a sync with the nature, keep a balance with the nature. So when we talk about uh, the, every living body, when the scripture says every living body is made up of five natural elements, the five natural elements are water, earth, fire, air, and of course, um, space. Now water in uh, Sanatan Dharma or Hinduism? Well, when uh, it absolutely amazes me the way our saints or sages or rishis they um, described everything or they wrote everything in those scriptures. That was all so very scientific and so logical now when we see that. And at that time, of course, it was um, very difficult to understand. So they always simplified it through symbols, sanctified the whole thing, which was very scientific and people could not understand it in a scientific way. So it was all symbolized in the way of religion and, and that definitely helped actually people to, to form their karma. As far as uh, water is concerned, all the, of course, all the elements are very important in Hinduism. But water, well, as scientifically we all know that human body is made of 70% um, of water. And uh, very rightfully, very logically, in Hinduism, water occupies the highest place amongst all the elements. It is, uh, to be said, is the water is life. Water is nectar, water is described as the um, source of uh, creation, source of life, source of prosperity, ambrosia, and so on. So many words are given for water um, in Hinduism and scriptures. And, uh, uh, well, it is um, unlike other religions. Of course, I would say totally unlike other religions also, in the daily rituals, there is uh, some or the other way water is used. But in Hinduism, 
right from the birth to death, every ritual, water is used. And it's a very, very, very important tool or important aspect of the religious rituals that are being followed. And at the same time, um, we celebrate water. Water is uh, very uh, beautifully celebrated in India. And through every festival, as you can see, um, be it a festival uh, on, most of the festivals are on the riverbanks. You know, I mean, see the biggest festival is the Kumbh, which is um, held on the, um, the, the very, very important rivers, the, um, like Ganges and Yamuna and other rivers and Saraswati River, which are, which are very, very important and which are like uh, treated as god and goddesses. The rivers are treated as god and goddesses in, in India. And this the big festival, Kumbh, happens there every 12, year and, uh, 12 years. And then millions and millions of people come there to take a holy dip in the river, to clean the sins of their souls. So it is like, uh, uh, it, it's like, uh, we are celebrating water all the time, you know, every festival uh, you will see uh, there is a festival where idols are being immersed in the water so that to actually culminate the whole festivity. Even the beginning of the festival, if you see every small ritual or the, the prayer we do, um, there are customs. When we do, when, when in every uh, ritual you will see the nine planets are being, um, you know, worshipped first. And then before all that, water is worshipped in the form of coconut. The reason why Hindus pray coconut, or they do worship of coconut, because coconut has water in it. That's a symbol of water. And this is how water is so, so very important in Hinduism. Now, the, of course, there are cool, very, very cool, and very, very interesting stories about water in, in Hinduism. And uh, in fact, uh, as I said, that even the rivers are treated as goddesses, as mother, are worshipped, a very important part of our life. And uh, there are legends and there are stories how they came on the earth. It is said in the Vedic scriptures that um, the, the importance of water here also, uh, we, can, we can feel, we can see that how it is written in the scriptures. And in, in Rig Veda it says that uh, to actually flow life on the earth, the gods in the heaven, they release the water from heaven in the names of rivers down on the earth. So this is how also river is, or the water is seen as a source of life, source of creation, source of prosperity. And the, the, the beautiful legend about Ganges or Ganga is, um, Ganges was actually um, was called upon on, on earth. Um, by a very, very rigorous fast and the worship done to Lord Shiva by a, a king down on earth whose uh, ancestors, around 60,000 ancestors, were died because of some bad doing and then there was no respite for their soul. And the only way they could, uh, their souls could be free and their sins could be clean was to Ganga come down, Ganges come down and uh, flows upon those ashes. And uh, this is how finally, after so much of uh, worshipping Lord Shiva and worshipping uh, the god Indra, the Ganges came down on earth and cleaned the sins and released the souls of those 60,000 um, uh, king's son on the earth. So this was one story. Then there is, uh, that also like, it's a, it's a symbol how the water can be even cleansing your souls by cleaning your sins. So it is it's, it's the importance of water which is shown by these symbols, these legends, these cool stories that we have in our religion. And uh, there is another very significant story about uh, uh, Lord Krishna um, uh, actually subduing a huge, very poisonous snake in, in River Yamuna, which is actually um, the main, one of the main rivers uh, along with after Ganges. And um, there, there was this huge poisonous snake which was polluting the water. And then Lord Krishna went inside and he fought with that snake. And, uh, and after subduing it, telling him to leave the water so that people around, living around the banks of Yamuna could uh, actually enjoy and take advantage of that water. So that is also a way of saying that to clean the polluted water, it's, it's like 
the message that has been conveyed by these stories are to actually take water seriously, to, to give respect to the water. And um, but I, I think the Hinduism entirely is uh, the kind of stories and it's very much uh, is a great example of symbolism. You know, the symbols are given um, and by examples things are said, things are shown and addressed to the common man and the sanctified and glorified in a way that, you know, people, because of the entertainment in it, follow those stories instead of giving them a very serious, intense, a scientific description, which, which is absolutely is happening now after, you know, people are going back to Upanishad after, you know, quantum of theory and all such theories are coming up and they realize that it is there in the scriptures where we can get the examples of, uh, you know, treating um, the natural elements with a lot of respect. And there is a scientific reason, there's a logical um, uh, reason behind it. Similarly, um, uh, rain gods, there is, a, and as I was listening to my other panelists, and they were saying that rain is given by the gods. Of course, that is also a symbol, symbolically is there in the Hinduism as well, where Lord Indra is the um, god, of river, or god of rain, who actually provides rain to the earth. And, um, and then quickly we go to the importance of water in Hinduism. Well, if we see the, the very Indus Valley civilization happened on the banks of Indus River. So India, where, um, which is the birthplace of Hinduism, of Sanatana Dharma, the, the, the mere existence, the entire existence of that country is on the bank of the river. So we can see how important water has been in our lives. And uh, uh, the rivers, the, the rivers, the importance of rivers and the water, the way it is, because of the worship and they're called mothers, the rivers are like um, very, very important. Taking a dip in the river is even cleaning the body, from cleaning the body to cleaning the sins, the river is important. That is because there is this purifying quality of running water in general. Again, it is, which is very, very logical that uh, the water, running water is pure, it takes away the pollution. Well, water has this quality to absorb the pollution, but when it's running, it takes away the pollution as well. That's why this sheer quality in the river has given them this kind of respect by the general public. They are known as the, the cleansing thing. The whole rivers are like cleansing sink cleansing the sins, cleansing the body, cleansing the dirt. And the very reason why, uh, if you see the um, uh, rivers are uh, treated as goddesses or as mothers, like uh, Ganges, because of their uh, quality of nurturing the soul. It is uh, proven, it is there in India even today. If you see all the places around the banks of Ganga River Ganges are very fertile and very well cultivated and it's very, very prosperous areas, where not only because the people are um, happy because of it, because it's, it's prosperous, they, all those areas have become a big center of cultural activities as well. So it's exactly the form of, like it's, it's the source of prosperity, as we can say. And that's why, the, because of nurturing ability, the, God, the rivers are treated as mothers. And, um, and in the end, I would, I would like to say that uh, when, when people go to Ganges and it is believed in Hinduism that if you take a dip in the Ganges river, your sins are gone, you're totally clean, your soul is clean. That is because I think, you know, like a mother, river Ganges uh, would like, would, would take anybody in the water, even if, uh, for, for, for the mother, the child is never dirty. You know, anybody can come and get pure and clean in the water of Ganges. And um, if we see the other importance of water in Hinduism, as I said, all the important rites, right, from the birth to death, water is used as the very, very most important thing or object or the element as far as Hinduism is concerned. Now we come to teachings and the practices for water in Hinduism. <coughs> it is believed in, and it is said in Hindu scriptures, that all the natural elements on the earth are limited. 
So, when you have limited resources, what do you do? You use them very carefully, very responsibly, without wasting it. I think the biggest teaching of Hinduism to the mankind is to use your resources very responsibly. Use the resources as offerings and not as privileges or taken for granted. It's like when we say offering, it's like, you know, uh, in temple, I don't know if you know about this practice in Hindu temples, there is a little edible offering is given to the gods and after uh, actually giving it to the god, it is uh, distributed among all present in the temple and it is, the, the main object is to, to give the offering to everybody present in the temple so that everybody enjoy the blessing of the god. So it is usually given, it's small in quantity, so it's usually given in small quantity so that everybody enjoys that blessing. Similarly, natural elements, we should take like an offering by the nature and we should, it's a simple formula of sharing basically. Sharing the elements, sharing the resources with everybody. If we use responsibly the sources, if we do not waste them, it's like respecting them basically, respecting these resources and then not, and conserve, conserve for the future generations. When I see the rishis and the sages of Hindu, uh, the old Vedic scriptures, if you see the way they have mentioned, I see them as great visionaries, absolutely great visionaries, because at that time, the problem of the scarcity of the resources, the problem was not that great deal. But yet, they used it very responsibly, thinking about the future generation, because they somehow could see the times coming ahead in the future. And of course, at the same time, just uh, when we sit, talk about, um, here when we talk about water, water is not just the one aspect of the environment. Everything, as the Hindu philosophy goes, everything is independent, interdependent in the cosmos. So all the elements, the whole ecosystem should be balanced. There is, um, uh, there has to be um, uh, an eco-friendly, this is how Sanatana Dharma is an eco-friendly philosophy because um, they see that to actually uh, keep this world going, it's important that we save and we use the resources very smartly so that future generations can also um, get the benefit of it and they don't run out of the resources. And the very reason why we are facing the problems nowadays because of this um, um, unresponsible or the irresponsible way of using the resources. We feel that the resources are independent and it is for us, as uh, it was there in the video, says that as long as the water is running in the tap and the flush is working, we are fine, which is not the case. There are so many people in this world who don't have toilets, who have to walk nine miles to get some water. So. So this concept of sharing, this concept of conserving for the future generation, for the fellow generation, I would say, it's, it's a very much a, a great teaching for the Hindus, uh, by the Hinduism. And uh, as far as um, uh, the example, the living example, I would say, would be a very, very shining example of the recent times would be Mahatma Gandhi, who was a staunch Hindu by practice. He, his um, ashram uh, in Phoenix, in South Africa, was a brilliant example of organic farming and self-sustaining farming based on everything green. The whole thing was uh, used on uh, like all the resources which he did so respectfully. He actually uh, used to live in bare minimum things, you know. It's like he used only what was needed. He used to use one um, tumbler of uh, water to clean himself, a small branch to clean his teeth, so that, you know, nothing is going waste. At that time, people saw him, they thought that he's a lunatic, but now they remember him as a visionary. And he said that there will be times when we would be fighting for the resources. And he said very beautifully one thing, 
that um, nature has enough to give what man needs, but not enough to man's greed. So I think, uh, again, a brilliant example of how to live in limited resources and then not taking resources as for granted and uh, using the resources very, very responsibly is the core of a teaching of Hinduism as far as the natural resources is concerned. Now when we come to Hinduism and current water situation everywhere in the world, but here we were talking about the Texas. Of course, as we, I have already said that we believe that everything is limited in this world, all the natural resources are limited. So using very, very responsibly is one thing. Population is growing and the water resource is limited. So again, whatever we are, whatever we are consuming, all we need to do is to reduce that consumption, just reduce your share of consumption and provide that share to the other person who has just come into this world. Connect to with water. I think what I absolutely loved in the first video that we, sh we saw about the water when uh, Andy was saying that I, 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 I want kids and people to come and feel the water connect with the water, to actually relate with the problems in the water. I think this is a great Hindu practice already. We see we go to the holy river to take a dip. Uh, we do immersions in water. We are actually playing and celebrating with the water. So there is a deep connection towards water in Hinduism, which needs to be developed, I think, which could be a great tool to actually make people aware of uh, problems related with the water. Worship the water, as we do in Hinduism. I think worship is the highest form of respect. When you respect something, when you care for something, it's like worshipping that person or that object, or that, in this case, natural resource, the water. If we respect this natural resource, we use it with care, and we use it with responsibility. It's like respecting that natural resource. And that respect is shown in the way of uh, when we uh, worship river, when we worship the symbol of river, when uh, we worship the God, that, okay, please, God, give us some rain. There is a drought-like situation. So that time, the value of the resource, the value of that, the respect of this resource is shown through the worship. And then combine the karma of authority and public. Now, this is a very important thing, and um, we just cannot say all the time the authorities of the government, they should do enough, they made the wrong policy, this and that, but of course, they are the people, you choose them, they are sitting there making policies, they are your, your representatives. What are we doing as public? What is our duty? It, it is the combined duty or the karma of authority and public which is required now. I would like to give a brilliant um, story. In ancient India, um, I would say like in uh, till 10th or 11th century, there was this beautiful practice um, done by the king of a, a region and the public of the region was uh, even, even in today's time we can get see the examples. In the capital of India, Delhi, there was a time when there were 400 ponds, and the pond in one region was the responsibility, was sponsored by the king, and was taken care by the public, the general public, who would use the water of that pond. But the whole sponsorship, the money and the care was given by the king. And this is how the, the need of the water by rain harvesting, creating the pond, you know, collecting the rainwater. That was a very, very common practice in, in ancient India, and which was a great source of water to the people living in that region. So, same similarly, right now, what we need is the combined effort, combined karma or action of the authority and public working towards this problem together. At the same time, very, very balanced approach uh, towards environment is needed. When we say water problem, well, it is an environment problem. And all the natural resources are interconnected. When we say um, we want to improve the water situation, 
well, we need to plant more trees. We need to, need to keep the environment green. We need to take care of the, all the aspects of the environment. And then we can actually tackle all the problems together instead of handling one problem at a time, which is not, which is not possible. And there again, Hinduism provides that kind of uh, um, teaching that uh, how the whole nature or the whole env environment is, is independent and it grows together, comes together. So I think uh, Hinduism can provide a beautiful, beautiful uh, solution to the water problem. And uh, the solution comes, you can call it spirituality, but I simply call it common sense. If you have less resources, you use it less, you use less. If you have more, you still use responsibility, so it's responsibility so that you can use it for the longer time. It is as logical, as reasonable it is. Well, we do have um, uh, solutions like, you know, um, cleaning the seawater, making it, you know, uh, drinkable. But then, in this economy, all these methods require a lot of cost, a lot of money, and uh, which is not seen as a priority as yet, because again, we see it in the practical uh, world, the economy is bad. So what is the one thing that we can do immediately is to control our own karma, control our own action. Okay, we have to save the water, we have to conserve the water, we have to actually um, uh, you know, use it very smartly so that we can, um, you, we can use it for the longer time or the future generations can come and enjoy it as well. All I would say that um, in, in Bhagavad Gita, a very beautiful thing has written that uh, the person who is taking everything from nature and not giving it back anything is like thief. But we don't want to be thief. If we are getting from nature, we need to give it back with, uh, with our karma. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have time for uh, maybe two or three questions uh, for any of our panelists. And I'll bring the microphone to you if you have that. Yeah. Uh, what I found as a common theme was the sense of interconnectedness that we should have one for another in the light of our religious traditions and faith and how to make our faith more amenable to the caretaking that you describe as being so much a part of the Hindu tradition or what was. I think that if you live in the desert, you care for water. Um, and I think that dar during those times when our civilization was more a frontier society, we cared for one another more. I mean, you were speaking of, the, Dr. Green spoke of the, the whole problem of what has happened that we no longer care for one another as a community. Uh, and I think the, the things are sort of interconnected. So I think maybe what we want to carry from what we've heard this evening is what will we do next to try within our congregations and among the people we know to foster conservation of our own resources as a personal thing that we want to do uh, out of a sense of obligation to all of creation. So, do you have suggestions for us about projects? We got one very good suggestion from Dr. Lassiter that we go look at the source of our water and develop an appreciation for it. Uh, are you aware of other things that we should perhaps consider doing? Uh, that make us more aware of ourselves in creation and with the responsibility to take care of it. Do you want a question? I don't know. <laughs> Does uh, anyone want to respond? Maybe three. I think one of the things that uh, we found is most important, I, I sort of mentioned it very briefly, are communal rituals. Uh, 
such as you know going to the source of your water and blessing it or being part of your you know recognizing your watershed uh, I think that uh, liturgy can be important uh, and study uh, I think that one of the key uh, connections between religious environmentalism and <coughs> secular environmental science is the notion of interconnectivity, that we are intimately bound with the ecosystems that we live in, and that there are no really distinct barriers. And I think within our traditions, we can find many sources that emphasizes that we belong to a larger community of life, and not just little isolated, uh, you know, cells of, of human existence. So anything that can foster that, I think, is really important for a religious community that is bent on developing uh, the spiritual environmental consciousness. Uh, either of you want to respond to that? Um, I don't think I have anything specific that would be at the time. I would say that. Um, In terms of the, the spirituality of it, it floats free of success in a way. Part of the thing to understand is um, that to cultivate our love for one another, for other creatures, and to live into that love and to make it a real part of our lives is how we save ourselves, whether or not we can save the planet or not. Uh, the critiques we're giving are the critiques of the prophets not going to change everything. We're called to be faithful in love. And I think moving forward, that it's essential to keep um, track of that. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I think it might become increasingly essential, given this magnitude of what we're facing, that we remain true to that form of salvation which is real and um, is there for us no matter what. I, I would like to say one thing. Charity begins at home. You know, if we are looking for the solutions outside, but I think we should start saving and conserving water right from home. Our day to day lifestyle needs to be changed a little bit, you know, instead <coughs> of. Um, um, I would like to give one example of um, using a shower. Mm -hmm. Use bucket, one bucket of water. So that, these small things, these small changes can make a huge difference in the future as far as water is concerned. Thank you. Can I say one other thing? And that is, there is a significant literature out there um, in the social scientific literature about what impedes and helps policy formation and following of policy, uh, taking a range of interests and factors. We need to be, as a religious community, familiar with that literature and in dialogue with it. What I'm saying is I'm finding that literature missing something that we have to offer. But for us to move forward without being aware of these other factors, which are very real and which are frankly controlling in international, <coughs> national, and local conversation, about formation of policy, we marginalize ourselves, and then we're not in a good position to, to, to offer what we have discreetly and reasonably. I think it's critical for us to be involved there, but we, we, it, it's got to be informed involvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one other question. I don't have a question. I'm answering part of what you said. Uh, I think that the interesting thing about science is that it's really important to have a conversation and in this brochure right here, To Mend the World, on page four and five, there are immediate things that you can do. Secondly, you can, there are resources available. I have some of them. If you have a local group, that you could take these resources, which children love to do. They like to play with water. They like to look at water. You could take this into youth groups. 
You can even take it into Sunday school. They're 45 minute activities. And the most popular toy <coughs> in the world, do you know what it is? What? <laughs> Noah's Ark. <laughs> and the reason that um, we have looked at is because the story invites the children to save the animals. Excellent. All over the world, that's the most important toy. They are ready to do something. They are ready to go to you, with you, to the Trinity River and clean it up. They are ready to go with you to the Trinity River fishing pier and throw a line in. We did that at our school. The kids rode their bikes to the, to the point and we taught them to fish. And it was part of our water unit. Every age, there's something that they can do. A lab we had, catch the water from a drip at your house and measure it and bring it to school and let's see how much water we wasted. Everything. Yeah. It's there, but pick this up first. Thank you, and that's a great segue, the mention of a local group doing things <laughs> to our next commercial. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to hear from Paul. First, I want to thank all of our panelists for your insightful <laughs> We are going to transition to some groups. We've got a round roundtable set up in the back, and there's going to be some folks facilitating conversation. Uh, if you'd like to participate in that, to uh, think about ways to go forward, reflect on what we've heard. Uh, but before we uh, get to those groups, uh, we would like, because this is a, uh, an event that's meant to sort of launch or help to launch the Fort Worth chapter of uh, Texas Center of Faith, Power, and Light, uh, Paul Roach uh, from uh, Unity. Yeah, I'm the uh, senior minister at Unity Church of Fort Worth. My name is Paul John Roach. And uh, thank you so much for coming and thank you for the inspiring uh, talks we've heard tonight. Truly have been inspiring and uplifting for, for me and I know for everybody else here. I want to thank Tim and Bright for um, allowing us to co host it because we just have got this group off the ground. This is our first official meeting. We've had a steering committee meeting. Uh, for the last few months, but this is our first official kickoff of uh, Fort Worth uh, Interfaith Power and Light. And we want to thank Amanda, of course, and uh, and B for all the work they they've done because they're down in Austin with uh, the Texas uh, Interfaith Power and Light and Texas Impact. I'd like to ask Ed, those people who are on the steering committee if you'd stand right now and just share with us your your spiritual affiliation and and. Uh, um, anything else you want to share about about what what you hope for for uh, interfaith power and light in Fort Worth? So let's just share some information. Thank you. My name is Jackie Cox. I'm with TCU uh, and University Church. And what I hope that interfaith power and light will do is move forward in terms of inspiring others to come and work with us so that we can, in fact, be a force for conservation of God's creation in this city. Thank you. Well said. I'm Sharon Ritchie, and I hope the same. I'm with the Disciples Church. I'm Melissa Ashmore. I'm with um, First Congregational Church, the United Church of Christ. I, um, I resonate with the justice in the equality of taking care of the environment, that it's taking care of the rest of us. I'm Sandra Soria with University Christian Church, and my hope is that we will continue to meet both for educational reasons and to help gird each other for the struggles that we need to face in order to help help everyone realize how important this is and it's not something our grandkids can fix for us. We've got to get going on it. 
My name's uh, Quinn Garcia, and I'm from the long distance of right here. <laughs> I work on the other side of those doors. And uh, I'm a United Methodist by background. And I, I really hope that this uh, organization can do a lot of what we've talked about tonight and work as an interdependence group, a group that works with multi-faiths in um, a city and a location that is full of a diverse group of people that need to be working together on these issues and learning from one another to how we can better address an ecosystem as people who have come together as a system of faith um, from all different walks of life. So that's my hope and my goal. But what can I do for my life? Thank you. And we meet on the second Monday of each month from 6.30 to 8 at the First Congregational Church on Trail Lake. And uh, you're very, that's correct, isn't it? It's the, the, the First Congregational Church. It's on the, what's the actual address? 4201 Trail Lake Drive. 4201 Trail Lake Drive. And uh, you're very welcome to attend. And right now we have snacks at the back here and tables together around. Plus there's a sign up for Texas, um, Fort Worth Interfaith Power and Light, if you'd like to be on that, or if you want to be on the Texas version as well. Um, and if you'd like to gather around these tables, we'll have a short discussion and one of one of the steering committee will, will lead that discussion. And please help yourself to the refreshments. <coughs> Thank you. 